don't we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and a little bit of praise today? We're going to sing a little chorus. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord. Let's magnify the Lord.
How many know the Lord's going to be with us today? Amen. Would you come up close? Just come up close. Let's all just come up for some prayer right now. God bless, God bless, God bless. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Maybe we could just bind together because we are here today to hear the word of God. And I know God is going to touch us. You guys are going to sing us another song right before Take somebody's hand if it's appropriate, and let's just lift up one another. Students, just kind of spread out over there. God bless you. I feel like it's going to be a special day. We want all of our sponsors and our speakers, guests, to come up with us on the platform. Now let us raise our hands toward the Lord and ask him to speak to us through the preaching today, through the Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your love, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, I pray that you'll let your spirit fall upon us. Move in us, God. Touch us in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're not here by accident. The Lord's put us all together in this place. We need a word from the Lord. The sermon's going to touch us. Open up our hearts. Somebody's going to be able to say, I went to that meeting and God spoke to me and it made a difference in my life. You can't do it by yourself, but you got a God that's with you and a God that will help you and a God that will guide you through every trial. Can I get a witness? Do I have a believer in the house? Shake hands with somebody. Tell them you love them. Sing us another song, gang. God bless you. Run. 
that right now. Let's lift him high. Let the high praises of God be in our mouth. Clap your hands, lift your voice. Let's live him together. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, let's sustain that praise a little bit this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I still feel you in this house this morning. Blessed be the mighty name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord in a great way this morning. Amen. Amen. What a tremendous atmosphere of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I expect some great things from the Lord. I know that He has prepared some things for us. I want my heart to be ready to receive those things that He has prepared. Amen. Would you help me? Let's, let's thank praise. Haven't they brought us into the presence of the Lord? What tremendous singing and worship. Amen. IBC Choir will be hearing more from IBC Choir tonight. God bless them richly. Tonight, uh, this morning, we're so grateful to bring our first speaker. Honored that he is with us. He almost wasn't able to be with us. Dorian was about to keep him in Florida. But we're so thankful and thankful that uh, devastation was spared on, uh, in Florida. We're so grateful for that this morning. But it's, uh, it's an honor to have Brother Jody Wells with us. He spent several years at Nassau and was even the, uh, he was the spokesman for the shuttle program there before pastoring there. He was always involved in ministry, but before he went to pastor at Titusville, Florida, pastoring there 16 years. Would you please help me welcome Brother Jody Wells. We're so glad that he's here. We want him to preach the word of the Lord this morning. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise, and would you lift your voice up to him? We've been singing, we've been praising. Come on, right now, just begin to shout unto him with the voice of triumph, which embodies faith. Father, we praise you, we worship you, we glorify you for what you've already done and what you're about to do. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I am so honored to participate in this great conference to even be here. I give honor and thanks to Brother Mooney and to the Mark Committee for inviting me. Uh, truly shocked to get the call. Um, I do consider it a privilege to minister to such a great company of ministers. Uh, the men on this platform uh, have shaped me over the years and recently in their preaching and teaching growing up in this precious truth, and uh, then to look across the audience of the folks gathered, and in particular the students, I know you didn't have a choice but to be here, <laughs> but wow, you look good, thank you for faking it this morning, fake it till you make it, no, they, they are being developed as this last generation, I believe, to carry this gospel. And so to stand here is, is a pretty heavy thing in that regard. I believe the Lord has given me a clear word for this meeting. Um, sermons have become a, a here and there thing for me of late. The Lord has really been dealing with me in themes. And um, there are three themes that the Lord has really been drilling into me the last year or two. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach all three of them. Um, it might feel like it, but I promise I won't. Uh, and and when, when you get in that vein, it's a challenge. Um, Brother Mooney was helping us last night with realizing where the rubber meets the road. You need to get a word from God. You need to get a word from God. And, and so... It becomes a challenge when you know what the Lord wants you to say. I Frankly, I'd rather bring one of the other themes, especially because some of the guys on the platform have heard the theme that I'm about to preach, but the truth is the Lord didn't send me to preach to them. And I feel confirmation that I am supposed to go down this path. Um, and so I do appreciate that. I, I appreciate the liberty, but more than anything, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this place. And I believe God is going to do something. I believe he is. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 2. And then we'll go to verses 33 through 35. Exodus 28 and 2. 
And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And then verse 33, speaking of those garments, and beneath upon the hem of it, thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister. And his sound, not referring to the bell, referring to Aaron. And his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord and when he cometh out, that he die not titles um, are really difficult, um, and I haven't given one to them. I'll just say uh, the sound of your ministry, the sound of your ministry. If you want something catchy, bells and pomegranates. Would you extend your hands to me in prayer, and I will pray for you that God's word will do its intended purpose. Father, I thank you for your spirit that is in this house. I am grateful for your people that are hungry for your presence and for your word. I ask for a fresh anointing, God. I ask, Lord God, for your word to come forth without fear, without favor. God, without any doubting that we would receive it and that we would do it. I pray this and give you thanks for your word in the name of Jesus Christ. If you are thankful for the word of God, clap your hands one more time and tell him, thank you for your word, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I, 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 I look at words like renewal in the midst of this beautiful and, and, and timeless conference and the word renewal has so many different meetings, meanings, but we talk about revival, we talk about renewal, and a lot of times we think about just a, an absolute Holy Ghost uh, revival service where the Spirit of the Lord is refreshing and renewing us, and I believe that is, in fact, where renewal uh, begins. And I think, however, the need for renewal is what has been driving these themes that the Lord has been dealing with me, one of which is understanding the Sabbath. I'm not going to be preaching about the Sabbath, but this has been the theme that led me to the theme that I'm preaching about today. Why was I wore out? Why was I burnt out? Why was I tired? I'll tell you, because I was trying to do spiritual things in the flesh. And I think many times we deal with things like burnout because we're trying to do God things, and the best our flesh can do is good things. And I, I want to do God things. I want God to do God things. And if, if I will allow him to do that work, I, I, won't, I won't be as worn out. He said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you. And then the very next phrase says, put this yoke on. It seems like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? I'm forsaking one yoke to take on another. He said, but yeah, my yoke is easy and my yoke is light. What? In comparison to you trying to carry yours by yourself, if you take on my yoke, then my spirit carries it. And therein is the rest with which the weary shall be made to rest. With stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to my people. Yes, the renewal is the Holy Ghost, but it's not just receiving it or being refreshed in it. It's letting the Holy Ghost do the work instead of relying on your flesh to do the work. So if you are in this place and have responded to God's call to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you are part of his priesthood. If you teach the Bible, if you evangelize the lost, if you make disciples, if you officiate, operate, or serve in any part of the five-fold ministry, you are part of his priesthood. In fact, if you serve the body of Christ and labor in his kingdom of God at all, it doesn't matter if you're part-time, full-time, or overtime, you are part of the priesthood. 
modern and postmodern religious culture has categorized and subdivided workers in God's church with titles like clergy and laity and staff and volunteers. No wonder folks don't know whether they're serving the Most High God or working in their favorite nonprofit charity. We need to realize that we are part of a priesthood. When you realize you're in a priesthood, you don't look at folks and say, I'm a volunteer, you just better be glad to have me. You're called, you're set apart, you're anointed, you're empowered. Everybody say priesthood. So, so let's allow the original apostolic preacher to solve the mystery. 1 Peter 2 and 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I wonder if there's anybody here who is called into a priesthood, not just a vocation, not just a staff position, not just a volunteer, not I want to be on staff. God, I want to be in your priesthood. The world may long debate whether a minister is a glorified social worker or a paid professional, but let the church be clear. You're not just a volunteer. You're not just a part-timer. You're not just a staff member, a preacher, and you're not just a pastor. You are part of the royal priesthood, and as such, I believe all the principles and the promises of the priesthood are for us today. Since the beginning, the priesthood and temple work have been irrevocably connected to the harvest. Feast days. Think about what happened at the tabernacle, what happened at the temple. Everything was surrounding the harvest. Feast days, sacrifices, rituals, directly connecting to the gathering season of the grain fields and the vineyards. Even the libation offerings coming from the fruit of the vine and the grain or flower offerings coming from the fruit of the field and every feast associated with the harvest. His last supper, Jesus, our high priest, talked frequently about the wheat and the grape harvest. His last supper shared the grain and the grapes of communion with his 12 priests in training. I personally believe that the connection of the wheat harvest and the new wine outpouring on the day of Pentecost, we know it was the 50th day after Passover. We understand it was associated with the wheat harvest, but it was also the outpouring of a new wine, as Joel prophesied that it would be. This is, I believe, carrying out a fruitful promise to God's New Testament church. I believe the grain harvest represents souls. I believe the grain harvest represents souls that the Lord of the harvest expects to reap. And I believe the grape and the olive or the fig, the fruit harvest represents his expectation of spiritual fruit. Every harvest in the Bible, folks, is not about souls. Now, you're talking to a guy who all I've been about is soul winning and disciple making. Before I knew I was called to preach, I knew I was called to win and disciple souls. So, man, you just give me the word harvest anywhere in the Bible, and I was going to make it about souls every time. But it just isn't true. It's not the only harvest that our Lord of the harvest is looking for. I believe he's looking for a harvest of souls and a harvest of spiritual fruit in his people. After all, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abides in me bears much fruit. With that foundation established, let's take a closer look at the New Testament apostolic priesthood of which we are a part. Look at your neighbor and ask them this question. Are you carnal or are you spiritual? Now, you'll notice I made that a question. It's not your job to tell them you are carnal or you are spiritual? It's a question. It's just a question. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. The great apostle Paul writing to that church in Corinth. And he said, and I, brethren, 
could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So carnality is akin to immaturity. Even as unto babes in Christ, verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. Paul's allowed to call them carnal. Verse 3, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you, how do I know? What's the proof? There's envy, there's strife, there's divisions. Are you not carnal? And walk as men. Are they saved? Yes, but they're carnal. We need to know the difference between sinful and carnal. Carnal will lead to sinful, but you better guard on carnality as well as guarding on sinfulness. You might be carnal and not, might not be committing a sin. We need to know the difference. As modern day priests, sometimes we want ministry success so badly that we impose our carnal help on a spiritual God. With mostly pure motives, I'll, I'll give that. With mostly pure motives, we seek tools and tactics and strategies to produce a harvest that we can be, I'm sorry, that God can be proud of. I was given a challenge. I'm not preaching this to you out of superiority. I'm not even preaching this to you out of revelation. I'm preaching this to you out of correction in my own life. The Lord needed to bring an elder into my life very calmly but very directly looked and said, Jody, you've always prayed and fasted to find the will of God. I said, yes, sir. He said, but your problem is once he reveals his will to you, you give him the hand and you say, wait a second, Lord. And then you run to the drafting board and try to put a plan together to accomplish his objective. He gives me the what, but God, hold it right there. I'll tell you how. And then you come back with your little plan and want him to hang it on the fridge. Father, look what I did. He said, he's not impressed. Can I be transparent about this? If you don't get this now, you'll find it out later by life. So I stood there, compliant, not submissive, big difference. And I was told, you see, you want to work for God, but he wants to work through you. You know why you want to? I said, I have a feeling you're going to tell me. He said, because you get credit. I said, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want credit. He said, no, 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 I'm not talking about public praise. I'm talking about just in the back of your mind knowing I did that. I helped that. I shaped that. So at this point, the compliance is wearing thin. And I politely said, may I ask a question? Absolutely. I said, then why doesn't God just call a bunch of mouth-breathing idiots to be his ministers, leaders, and administrators? Why does he call anybody with any sense at all? Why does he call anybody with a degree? Why does he call anybody with experience? Why does he call anybody with natural abilities, talents, and, talents and skills? Why does he just call the village idiot to be every pastor, to be every leader, to be every bishop, and every overseer? They're all like, man, he got serious in a quick hurry. And I said, he, he said, <laughs> and he chuckled at me. And he said, uh, you don't get it, do you? I said, I obviously I don't. He said, do you, do you know who the four and 20 elders are? And I was like, oh, Lord, this is going to be a while. Revelation. Yes, yes. And he said, what did they do when they stood before the, crown, or before the throne of the Lord? I said, they took the crowns off, threw it at his feet. He said, you're still wearing yours. He said, the Lord has crowned his people with gifts and abilities and talents, some even before they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They were given abilities and given talents and given skills. He said, but you're supposed to throw them at his feet. He's just waiting to see if you're going to rely on your crown or if you're going to give it to him and let him get the glory.
There's such a thing as false humility, folks. All this, yes, sir, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, people see straight through that business. Yes, sir, because I need to get what I need to get. Submission says the struggle is over, not delayed. Compliance says I'm going to say yes, sir, and do this for now until I get paid or until I earn my spot, or earn my stripes. Submission says, Lord, you're in charge, and whatever you want, I just say yes. Oh, did you put this person over me? Then I submit to this person and yield to the season, to the place, to the ministry where you have me now. I know I might be called to preach to thousands, but I'm going to go ahead and teach this Bible study to one. Not so I can go testify about it later and put it in my resume to get promoted, because that's what God called me to do today. Sometimes we want to impose this. I'm not, I'm not preaching against tools, hear me. I'm not preaching against intelligence. I'm not preaching against degrees. All of these things are great to have and good. Let's face it, God designed and gave a blueprint for the tabernacle and the temple. God designed the tools, the utensils, and instruments that were used in the temple. He's not opposed to tools. He's not opposed to plans. He's a God of plans. The tabernacle plan, the salvation plan, the redemption plan, all of these things are God's. He's a planner. He sees the end from the beginning. You can't do that without a plan. I'm not opposed to any of that, but what I am saying is God gives the plan, not us. And certainly not some book from a bookshelf. I might get knowledge from a book from a bookshelf, but I'm going to the book if I'm going to get the plan. From ancient times until now, the tools, the plans, the furnishings, and the ministry were designed by God, not by business leaders. And those tools affected nothing without the Shekinah glory of God showing up. Just visit the temple in Jesus' day. No Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Oh, there was a building, and there was a plan, and there was a system, and there were tools and utensils and strategies, but there was no glory, and there was no power until Jesus strolled in. And then the Shekinah glory came back into the temple. My system might do good, but my system will never do God. All the temple had in Jesus' day was symptom, systems and priests. But Jesus purged that carnal temple so that he could raise up another temple. Everybody say, that's me. Let's, let's have the best facilities. If y'all are with me, you can say amen. Let's have the best apps and uh, software and tools and equipment. But by all means, we must have the glory and the power of the Holy Ghost working in every aspect of our ministry. I said every aspect of our ministry. It's got to be the power of God at work, not just the power of my ability or my experience or my skill or my knowledge or my talent. Somebody say, give me the Holy Ghost. If we really want to harvest that pleases God and not just my neighboring competitor, I mean buddy, pastor. If we really want to see lost souls saved, if we really want to see people converted, if we really want them to become disciples, if we really want to reach the 7 billion people in this world and not just grow our little mousetrap to have retread apostolics throng to our buildings, if we really want to reach the multitudes of the lost, it's going to take the glory of God. We have enough systems. Keep them. I'm going to borrow one of your phrases, Brother Graham. Biggie size them. But we've got enough strategies. We're not missing those. We need a revival of spiritual fruit. And I'm not just talking about a good tongue talk and fall out in the aisle service. Have those as often as you can. But something's got to come out of that meeting. Yeah. 
We need a revival of spiritual fruit and spiritual gifts. Let us affirm Paul's cure to this carnal church in Corinth. Verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom, in the systems, in the strategies, in the philosophies of men, but in the power of God. I think we need to take a moment right now and realize what we have in this apostolic movement. I think we should take just a moment to stand to our feet and just shout thanksgiving to God that we have the demonstration of the Holy Ghost power in this precious apostolic church. Father, we thank you and praise you for the visitation and the administration and the operation of the Holy Spirit in our prayer meetings, in our Sunday school rooms, in our youth meetings, in our church services, in our rallies, in our camp meetings, in our conferences, we want your glory. We thank you for your glory. We praise you for your glory. Clap your hands and give God praise for the power of the Holy Ghost. You may be seated. I, I remember I was actively preaching. I was an associate pastor at my home church and working full time at, at this time and had the pleasure and um, stress of working with certain people and some of those were no disrespect to anybody in this line of work but lobbyists Whew. man oh man oh man I'm not going to get into it but man oh man if you talk about about lawyers take a step down no disrespect to lawyers either. I'm just saying if you do that, I don't do it. You do that. Lobbyists, man, they'll play both sides of the aisle. They'll have clients on the Republican side. They'll have clients on the Democrat side. I know because they've invited me to events, and they were in charge of both. And the, 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 the double-sidedness and the chameleon nature of their constantly changing compromise to accomplish what they think is the greater good and in that environment, I met one, and he knew. Of course, if they know anything about you, they're going to use that. They know, they'll, they'll find out if your kid plays volleyball, and they'll come up and just say, hey, how's so-and-so doing at volleyball? And you're like, wow, they really care about me. They don't know you or care. It's a leverage. It's a move. And so uh, one of these great gentlemen comes, and he's talking with me. He said, man, I, I hear you're a Pentecostal preacher. I said, yes, sir. He said, man, I tell you, some, one of the most important things that happened to our church was the gifts of the Spirit. And I was like, oh, do tell. <laughs> he said, well, you know, our church did a gifts assessment. And I was like, okay. It turns out I've got the gift of prophecy. You know that. Turns out. And I said, uh, I said, oh, okay. Really? He said, yeah. I mean, I can, far back as I can remember, I've just always had this sixth sense. Just kind of always knew what was coming. Just kind of knew that this was going to happen or that was going to happen. It's really helped me in my line of work. I think it's helped us do some good things. And, 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 and I realized immediately, you don't have a clue. And he was, he was being as sincere as, as he could come up with and as, as he could be. But it, let, let's, let's, let's just deal with this. The same guys that are cranking out gifts assessments are the ones that are cranking out the systems and strategies. That now, let's be simple. If you had it after your natural birth, if you could do it before you received the Holy Ghost, it's carnal.
It's the fruit of the, if you don't have the, then it's carnal. If it's spiritual at all, it's from a different spirit. This is really very simple. We did not call Usain Bolt the fastest man alive because he had the gift of speed from the Holy Spirit. It was his carnal ability, not sinful, but carnal. We didn't say that Ronald Reagan was the great communicator because he had the gift of the spirit of communication. He had a natural carnal ability. So why all of a sudden do we ascribe spiritual gifts to people who are using their natural abilities just because they're doing it in the church? Some Christians could sing before they had the Holy Ghost. Some of them are singing now without the Holy Ghost. Some preachers could speak. They may have had the gift of gab, but it's not the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you could speak before you had the Holy Ghost, that is not necessarily a gift of the Spirit. But we have fallen into this with some of our readings and, and studies. It's like, oh, that's a gift, and we'll even refer to it. You know, you're very gifted in the. Well, it's an ability. That's fine. It's a talent. That's fine, too. You can even call it a skill. Some of these things you wake up in the morning can do without any effort at all, without any prayer or fasting at all. But when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you, listen. If something changed inside of you, if something went to work on your carnality, if something is working through you, now we're talking about spiritual fruit. If someone was nice before they had the Holy Ghost, don't call them the fruit of kindness. They're just nice. But if they were mean yesterday, got the Holy Ghost today, and now they're kind, we might be talking about fruit. Now, I realize y'all like... He's yelling, but I don't know why he's so excited about this. I learned about the fruit of the Spirit in primary Sunday school class. That's the problem. You heard about it before you got the Holy Ghost, and then once you got the Holy Ghost, we stopped teaching about the fruit of the Spirit. That's for the Baptists to do. Because the only fruit we want to worry about is tongues. That's the initial fruit, and you better believe it, and you better preach it. The initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Ghost is speaking in other tongues. But as you mature, you can't just be baby-talking all the while. There ought to be kindness. And there ought to be faithfulness. There ought to be long-suffering. But I talk in tongues. Praise God. We talk in tongues more than you all. But I would that you prophesy. fruit that comes from the vine because I am in the vine and because the vine is in me not because I'm close to the vine or because the vine needs me praise God Jesus Christ gave us the Holy Ghost anointing a Holy Ghost empowered priesthood so let's take a closer look at the garments of the priesthood everybody say fruit and bells Exodus 28, verse 33 and 34, And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof, the bells of gold between them round about. And then if in the typical redundancy of the law, 34, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, just to make sure you get it, upon the hem of the robe round about. God designed the priest's garments, but the priest had to put it on. It's just like the garment of praise. You want to get rid of the spirit of heaviness, he gives you the garment of praise, but you got to put it on. He's never going to make you praise. And he's never going to put, make you put on the priest's garment. He's just going to give it to you. But you've got to put that garment on. When he did, the bells and the fruit alternated with each other on the hem of his garment. The bell only rang, hear me, the bell only rang when it made contact with the fruit. When the bell and the fruit came together, the priesthood's ministry made a sound. It was the sound of the priest's ministry, the bell ringing against the fruit. 
Verse 35, and it shall be upon Aaron to minister. This was not an accoutrement. This was not an accessory. This was there for the purpose of ministry. And his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. The Bible does not call the bells and the pomegranates ornaments, does not call them options or accessories. They are there for the priest to minister. These bells and fruit were worn when the priest entered into the holy place, into the place of ministry, ministering unto the Lord and ministering unto God's people. Interestingly, the sound is not called the bell's sound. It's not called the fruit sound. It's not called the robe's sound. It's called Aaron's sound. It is the priest's sound. I believe that the pomegranate that is on the priest's robe represents the fruit of the Spirit that we read in Galatians 5. And I believe that the bell that is on the robe represents the gifts of the Spirit. And I believe that these elements of our New Testament priesthood are essential and indispensable. They're not just for the kooky and for the special. They are the sound of ministry at work in us. They are the proof of a fruitful ministry. I'll go a step further. I believe that the fruit of the Spirit must be evident in a priest's life or the gifts of the Spirit will not be. I know that's tough to choke down. Some of you are going through the catalog of demonstrations that you have seen in services from people that you say, well, I know they weren't living the fruit, and yet the gifts of the Spirit operated in their life. Listen, he, Paul said, I'm jumping ahead, but I feel this in the Holy Ghost. Paul said, you can be a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. These two have to ring against each other. Let me make one more step. If we do not covet these fruit and we do not covet these gifts, I believe it is an indication that we are more comfortable with the carnal than we are with the spiritual. You see, carnal gives me control. Carnal gives me credit. No flesh shall glory in his presence. So this is what you need to use as a little quick barometer. If you are getting glory and you are getting praise, then you should know that the Lord is nowhere near that conversation. Oh, he doesn't. Yes, he's got the authority, the power to, to squash us or to do these kind of things, but he's such a gentleman. The Lord is so deferential to us and our free will. He will never impose himself on our free will. So he gives us the will to accept praise, affirmation, and glory, or the will to give him the glory, the honor, and the praise. And when he sees us take the glory and the praise, it's a U-turn. Not because he doesn't love us, but because it's written in his word. No flesh shall glory in his presence. He's not going to kick you out of the pulpit. He's not going to kick you out of the altar. He's not going to kick you out of that staff meeting. He's not going to kick you out of that planning session that you're doing. He'll just leave. No flesh shall glory in his presence. And when we get in the business of glorifying the flesh, he ain't in the meeting. I believe that the pomegranate on the priest's robe represents the fruit. I believe that the bell on the robe represents the gifts of the Spirit. And I believe that these are indispensable. Spiritual versus carnal. God gets all the control and God gets all the credit. But let me just speak to those who might be tired and burnt out and worn out. And let me just say this too. This is not an indictment nor is it a rebuke because I've been there, I've lived it and done it with the purest of motives. You want to work hard for Jesus. You want your father to be proud of you. You want to do well for him. That's usually the motive. But when we try to do it ourselves, so if you're trying to do spiritual things through carnal methods, you got to get ready. You don't just get the credit, you also get the blame. 
You see, when it's God's plan and God's anointing and God's spirit, you just do what he says, how he says it. The people either respond or don't. That's on them. But when it's all you and you put it together and strategize it and said, well, what if this happens? Well, let's in run that. And what if they get off on this high path? Well, let's get off. You got to let, if God will not impose his will upon man, who are we to impose our will? Just preach what thus saith the Lord. Lead where he leads. Follow where he goes. And if people bail, then they bail. You see, if it's him and it's his plan and it's his spirit, I don't get the blame or the credit. And my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Everybody say the fruit. Jesus placed a major emphasis on fruitfulness. He said every tree that doesn't bring forth fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And then we have his encounter with the fig tree to show us what he means. Mark 11 verse 13 And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Jumping to verse 19, And when even was come, he went out of the city, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. This is often called as a subtitle in your Bible, Jesus curses the fig tree. But what Jesus did was remove the tree's ability to bear fruit, and that killed the tree. It was fruitlessness that resulted in a dried up tree. There can be no mistake, Jesus desires fruit. In fact, the fig tree account begins with Christ. The Bible says he was hungry for fruit. Do you understand? He's not tasking you out. Yes, we're bondmen. Yes, we're servants. Yes, we're laborers in the vineyard and laborers in the harvest. And yes, we work for him. But don't you remember, he said, pray this way. Our father, he's our father. He loves us. He's not just tasking us. He doesn't just give you a daily to-do list. He wants to work through you like a father might be proud of his son when his son's doing a good work or he's doing a good work through his son. When we get this understanding, the Lord is hungry for us to do well. He is hungry for us to produce fruit. He desires your ministry to bear fruit. He desires the gifts to operate through you. He's not trying to task you or whip you or club you. He just wants you to let him do it. How do we define fruit? I believe that is where it begins. I don't know an apostolic leader in this great movement who doesn't want to yield fruit to the Lord. We've got great men and women, great leaders in this movement that want to be fruitful. But how do we define fruitful? And how we define, I think, determines whether we use carnal or spiritual methods. Because if fruitful is only metric in the carnal, then we will use carnal methods to achieve the carnal metric. But if he gets to define what's fruitful, do you remember that he said some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold? Do you remember the parable that there was one that only brought back double of a talent and the other brought triple and the other? Every one of them was a good and faithful servant. You ought not to go to a conference or a camp meeting or a banquet or a dinner and let anybody ask you and it bother you, how many you running? I'm running as many as the Lord God is letting me reach. I'm running as many as the Lord thinks I can handle. If your metric is square footage of a building, if your metric is bottoms in a pew, then you'll go get other people's bottoms already saved. You'll just build a better mousetrap, and then all the apostolics will come flooding to your church, and you'll say, we've had growth. And yet your building may have had growth, but the kingdom hasn't grown an iota. Are lost souls being saved? Are lost souls being converted? Are converts being discipled? That's growth. In the kid, that's fruitful. 
And if it's three or 300, it's good and faithful. He gives the increase. If he gives the increase, then he's the one that gives the metric. He's the Lord of the harvest, not me. I'm a laborer. He never said pray for rain. He's got that. He never said pray for sunlight. He's got that too. He never said pray about the crows and pray about the pestilence and the canker worm and the palm worm. He said just pray for laborers. I got the rest of it. He gives the increase. The number of people on our pews, the number of people in our breeze records or on staff are not the only fruit he desires. He also wants a harvest of souls, and that's just grain. But he also wants a harvest of grapes and figs and olives and pomegranates. Every harvest is not souls. I believe Jesus was teaching his 12 apostles that their priesthood was dead if it didn't manifest the fruit of the Spirit. I always heard growing up that the jingling bells on Aaron's robe. How many of y'all heard this in Sunday school? The bells on the end of this. It's a scary little story. It's good for the kids. We used to call them Holy Ghost stories. All right, kids. Now gather around. Let Brother Sunday School teach you, tell you what happened in the tabernacle that day. And the priest had a robe and had Bells. Never told us that it had pomegranates. I never even remember that. It had bells. It had bells on his garment. Do you know why those bells were there? No, teacher, tell us so we could have nightmares for a year. Well, according to nowhere in the Bible, they tied a rope around his ankle. And if he went in there, With anything on him. He dropped dead. (gasps) And they pulled his lifeless corpse out. And it was next man up. It's an NFL football team. Next man up. You know what? I I think I'm called to mow the grass outside the tabernacle. Yes, our God is holy. You still believe that? Our God is holy. And he expressed his priesthood to be holy. In fact, he said, remove the filthiness from the holy place. The only people allowed in the holy place was the priesthood. So the only way filthiness got in there was through the priesthood. He said, get the filthiness out of the priesthood and get the filthiness out of the holy place. So he is a holy God. But listen, the bells and the pomegranate were not a holiness issue. It was the sound of a priestly ministry. Exodus 28 and 35, look at the words carefully. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, watch, that he die not, not so you know he's dead. The bells were not there to let you know he was dead. The bells were there to let you know he was alive. And he was ministering on your behalf. And he was ministering on God's behalf. The sound of a living ministry is the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit operating through us. It's a living sound, not a dying sound. God is raising up a priesthood in this last hour. That makes a certain sound. No matter how dark the night, no matter how many enemies surround us, we can still hear the bells and the fruit ringing in the holy place of our apostolic churches. Yes, let us live holy. Let us be separated from this world. Let us be dedicated unto God. But all the holiness that we desire and aspire to will never take the place of Holy Ghost demonstration.
the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit are the, listen, let me just, tongues is the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost living in us. Everybody say in us. Holiness is the progressive evidence of the Spirit working on us. Everybody say on us. But the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit are the daily evidence of the Holy Ghost ministering through us. Galatians 5.22, you know it, you could quote it, you could probably sing a Sunday school song to it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the... They that are Christ have crucified the... With the affections and lusts, this is not just sexual or sensual. This is appetite. This is to consume. This is self-centeredness. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk, ringing the bells and the fruit. Live in the Spirit. Let us also walk in the Spirit. This is not the fruit of our discipline. Someone says, I need the fruit of the Spirit to operate in my life. The Baptists tell them, well, just try harder. Work harder. Here's a book of disciplines. The, the Methodists say, here's your book of disciplines. The Baptists say, come to this training class, and we'll train you for 32 months, and you can be, have the fruit of the Spirit from training. And everybody has their way. Look, the Holy Spirit is what produces the fruit of the Spirit, period. We so desperately want the gifts to operate. We so desperately want the bells to to ring in our churches and our ministries, but do we have the fruit for it to ring against? We Pentecostals are famous for coveting and operating in the gifts of the Spirit. At least a few of us. Tongues, interpretation, occasionally prophecy. And praise God for it, but I have been raised in this, and I don't believe I've ever heard someone say one of these phrases. Tell me if you have. Talking to someone in a hotel lobby or in the foyer of a church before a meeting or after a service. Wow, we had a real demonstration of the fruit of the Spirit last week. It's always the gifts of the Spirit. Or called by a pastor friend. Hey, man, you really got to have this guy preach for you. He really operates in the fruit. Ain't nobody going to fill a tent for, for fruit. We want the bells. We don't want the fruit. They ring against each other. Paul told the Galatian church before he revealed the fruit in their list, he said, the works of the flesh are manifest among you. He's talking about a saved church. The works of the flesh are manifest among you. They're in variance. They're in emulation. They're in wrath. They're in strife. And it's in it. See, these are the ones we don't worry much about. We want to get on idolatry and fornication and heresy. But variance is carnal and sinful. Emulation is carnal and sinful. Wrath is carnal and sinful. Strife is carnal and sinful. Envyings are carnal and sinful. They're just not as easy to preach against. Sex and paganism are not the only carnal issues facing our church. God has already imparted the gifts of the Spirit to edify His church. But in too many cases, between the bell is flesh instead of fruit. Between the bells is my flesh, and it rings against my flesh, which God can receive no glory. If the apostolic movement wants a spiritual revival, then we need a carnal decline. And that only happens through fasting and prayer. But it's easier to buy a new app, isn't it? It's easier to get the latest book. It's easier to go to a conference somewhere who's doing it cool. But fasting and prayer, God will reveal to you exactly what the church or the ministry or the group that he has trusted you with needs. Let us join Paul. I, I think that personal prayer, yes, but congregational prayer as well. I stand indicted before you. It's only been in the last three years that we've gone back to good old-fashioned prayer meetings in the church. Oh, the things are things of the past. No, oh, no, the things of the book of Acts. You'd rather write your congressman about somebody in jail than pray them out. They prayed them out of prison. Man, it's quiet. We'd rather be on a political action committee to change our country than hit our knees. 
I don't remember any time where Peter, James, and John lobbied. Well, they appeared before magistrates. Yes, at the favor and direction of the Spirit, not because they got in a pack and put a strategy together on how to manipulate policy. If you're looking for the government to fix this country, it ain't ever going to happen. The only way this country is going to be truly great again is by the power of the Holy Ghost. A revival of the Spirit. And you are his ambassadors. And you are his priesthood. And your bells and your pomegranates are ringing. And if they take you to Congress, go. But if they take you to Halfway House, go there too. Let us join Paul in coveting the gifts, but let us also cover the fruit of the Spirit. And I believe the core fruit of the Spirit is love. Why am I long-suffering? Because I love the person that's making me suffer. Not because I'm disciplined. If I make peace with one who is causing me strife, it's because God's love is moving through me. If I am gentle with someone who has been rough toward me, it's not my flesh. It's because God's love is inside me. Once my flesh is submitted, his love rises up to produce the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit. It was not coincident that the high priest engaged in sacrifice of flesh before he went into the holy place. Listen, can I preach for just a minute? We've got the tabernacle plan down in soterology. Yes, it is a model of salvation. Move on. It is also a model of the priesthood. I've still got to kill my, I don't just kill my flesh because I repented at senior camp. I don't just kill my flesh because I repented one time. I've got to die daily. I've got to get to that brazen altar every day. Not just because I sinned, but because I'm carnal. I'm still carnal. I've got to find that brazen labor. That brazen labor isn't just a model of baptism. It's a model of being washed and renewed and regenerated by the word of God. And he that looks into the perfect law of liberty is transformed by it. If they didn't just go to the tabernacle once a year. They were in there every day. They went to the, to the altar every day. There's got to be a place of death. Of my flesh, so that his spirit can flow through me. John 15 and 8, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. After my death on the altar, I put on a garment with bells and fruit and everybody in the camp knows that the priesthood is alive and that the glory of God is at work and operating in his camp or in his church. The love of God. How many times have I heard, how many times have I said it myself? If we could just have a manifestation of the gifts in our midst, the multitudes would come. If we could just get some blind eyes open or, or some dead rays, the converts would come. And the undeniable power of God will make them accept our holiness lifestyle and they'll be converted. If we could just see some supernatural miracles, signs and wonders. Folks, signs and wonders may have preceded Christ's teaching and preaching before the cross, but in the book of Acts, the signs always followed the preaching. They won't know us by our gifts. They won't know us by our miracles. They will know us by our fruit, by the love of Christ continuing in us. We have got to adopt Christ's motives for miracles, not just give Jesus a chance to show up and show out. I love that line. I use it all the time. Let's give God a chance to show up and show out. It's awesome. It's not a pride thing for him. He loves the sick. He loves the addicted and the bound. And if we'll let his love move through us, 
we will see the same miracles that moved him with compassion to raise up a, a leper. We'll move with compassion, not so I can text it or put it on Facebook or use it as a faith builder or use it to draw a crowd, but just because I love this person, I'm going to minister in the fruit and the gifts. It comes out of love. With Jesus, it was the pomegranate of love and then the bell of healing. Love the sick and see them healed. Love the bound and see them delivered. When we grow in his love, we will also produce fruit and gifts. The gifts of the Spirit not only testify of God's power, they testify of God's love like a ringing bell. Aaron's ministry had a distinctive sound. Your ministry has a distinctive sound. It is the sound of the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit working together. 1 Corinthians 12 and 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues to another interpretation of tongues. Many Pentecostal and charismatic groups have tried to hijack the gifts of the Spirit in a frenzy of sensual experiences, attempting to draw crowds and sell books and swell offering plates. Their events often degrade into sensationalism and debunk testimonies that weren't even real miracles and fake testimonies covered by a facade that call faith-building. This may appeal to half-baked Christians, but it rarely brings lasting conversion, nor does it bring faithful disciples. He can really do it, y'all. We don't have to help him with miracles. See, Pentecostals love to experience the Holy Ghost, but apostolics love to be governed by the Holy Ghost. I wonder sometimes if I, were, I was Pentecostal way too long before I became apostolic because all I wanted to do was get up in that one-day room, that upper room. I just want to be in that upper room every day of my life, all day. And it's a great place, but they didn't stay there. They immediately became apostolic, which means sent. And it took persecution to get them off the dime. He said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. Stephen had to die for them to scatter and preach. God help us if we won't let him send us with the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit to do a work, an apostolic work. And that apostolic, I referenced it in the panel this morning, it is the governance of the Holy Ghost, not just the feelings of the Holy Ghost. We're into feelings. You got your feels on today. We got our feelings, all about feelings, that I feel God, that I not feel God. God is here. He's very present, the Bible says. Whether you feel him or not, he's at work. How we interact with people is governed by the Spirit and proven by the fruit. How we minister is governed by the Spirit and proven by the gifts. The government of the Spirit is love. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six 36 proves this. Master, which is the great commandment? Everybody say commandment. Commandment is government. Jesus said unto him that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, on this government, Hang all the law and the prophets. It was still a gift of the Spirit in the Old Testament. Prophecy. Translation, what governs us, Lord? Love for God and love for others. And this love doesn't just provoke obedience, it provokes the gift of prophecy. God loved his people enough to give them the law. When his people disobeyed the law, he loved them enough to send them prophets. Whether they were there to warn them, correct them, or give them promises, the gift of prophecy came from God's love. There was a young man in our church that began to covet the gifts and felt like he was being used in the gift of prophecy, and he was, and it was prolific for some period of time, but he was very quiet and shy, and he wasn't flamboyant. He didn't want to grab the mic, and he didn't want to draw attention. I said, that's good. And he said, well, how do I do? I said, just come whisper it in my ear, and then we'll go from there. But you've got to get in the practice of responding to what the Holy Ghost is telling you, but be submitted and covered by an apostolic authority. So he began to practice that way, and he got good with it. He got comfortable. He'd come up, and he'd go. 
turn because he knew he wasn't going to do anything. One day I just took the mic and handed it to him. I'm like, I, but, but then he started operating in this gift as directed by the Spirit, as covered by the authority placed in his life. But something happened a few months later and it shut down. And he came to me and said, I don't know what's going on. I can't hear from the Lord. And there's been moments where I felt this hunger, but nothing was coming. I said, well, let's talk about what's going on in your life right now. Come to find out, he was dealing with so much within his ministry team. He was dealing with so much issues with holiness and separation, people bucking and being not submitted to the word of God and not surrendered to conviction of the Holy Ghost, that he began to have to become a policeman. He began looking at all their Facebook pages all the time and always having to pull the yardstick out and always having to do. And he was trying to do a good job. And yes, holiness and separation is a biblical precept and it is a non-negotiable. Without holiness, we cannot see the Lord. This is not a compromising statement, but I said to him, yes, hold that accountability and let me take care of the government, but you've allowed something to affect your love, and now the gift of prophecy cannot operate through you. Folks, this isn't magic tricks. It really isn't just for a special few. And no one possesses a gift. The gift possesses them. It's not my gift. He has the gift. No, the gift operates through you. When we start trying to take possession of these things, this is when flesh gets glory. We have to have this guy come to the meeting because he, he has the gift of. No, the gift has him. If we're submitted to the Holy Ghost, the gift has us. God loved his people enough to give the law and love. 1 Corinthians 13 and 1, and I'm closing. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, agape. I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. The Greek words for brass and cymbal can also be used in the Greek language for bells. And it sounds like the Holy Ghost is using Paul, that old temple worker, that old Pharisee of Pharisees, to convey a timeless message. God's church must operate in the legitimate gifts of the Spirit, but it also must be governed by the fruit of the Spirit. And I know the Bible wasn't written with chapter numbers, but it is written in the order of topic. And so chapter 12 is about gifts. Everybody say bell. Chapter 13 is about love. Everybody say pomegranate. Chapter 14 is about gifts. Everybody say bell. It's as if Paul is saying, I've been in the temple. I heard what used to happen there. I heard there used to be a sound of real ministry when the glory of God was there. But in this New Testament church, in your temple, in your priesthood, there's got to be the bell, the pomegranate, and the bell ringing against each other, if not with just a sound. Praise God, the authentic gifts of the Spirit are alive in the apostolic movement and well. Every minister, every leader, and every church represented in this house right now, God is speaking to His church in a prolific manner through tongues, interpretation, faith, prophecy, wisdom, and knowledge. He will manifest through discerning spirits, through healing and miracles in your midst at an unprecedented level. You will have dominion in your city. Evil spirits will be cast out. Converts will be discipled. The bound will be delivered, but not because we're loud and not because we employed a new strategy, but because God loves us and he loves them through us. And his love will drive each of us to a new level of prayer and fasting and demonstration. Would you stand with me? Thank you so much for your patience. If you're only interested in advancing your ministry, feel no pressure to participate at this moment. Who in this place truly believes that God has promised you a harvest of souls in your city or in your region? Would you raise your hand? You truly believe God has promised you. Don't take them down. Don't take them down. Come on, let's have some faith in this place. Those souls will know you by your fruit. Who truly believes that God has promised the fruit that you harvest will remain? Bring 
harvest has got to endure threshing. Everyone's talk about the harvest, but no one wants to talk about threshing. No one wants to talk about winnowing. No one wants to talk about sifting. But the fruit has to remain and be processed. The preached word of God and the gifts of the Spirit edify the church, making it a healthy body which re- performs the perfect will of God on earth. The gifts are at work in this place right now. I believe the gifts are already present in your home church, but the fruit of love will be the catalyst that activates them. If you desire a supernatural growth of spiritual fruit in your ministry, if you desire a supernatural growth of fruit, spiritual fruit in your church, please come forward for just a moment. Just for a moment. I, I, brethren, if I'm out of the will of God, please stop me. I, I promise I will submit and not just comply. You desire supernatural growth of spiritual fruit in your ministry. You desire supernatural growth of spiritual fruit in your church. We're going to start with the fruit of the Spirit. May I declare a promise over you. It's not an impartation. I don't have that kind of authority. I'm just speaking the word of God. The fruit of of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will see spontaneous growth in your ministry and in your church. Hear me. Joy will replace sorrow. Peace will replace conflict. Long suffering will replace discontent. Gentleness will replace cynicism. Goodness will replace unrighteousness. Faith will replace doubt. Meekness will replace pride. Temperance will replace recklessness. And last but not least, love will replace selfishness. Lift your hands right now and claim the promise of the fruit of the Spirit. If you are a tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-filled, apostolic believer, you need to raise your hands and lift your voices right now. Because the gift that is in you that was given by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, stir it up that the fruit might manifest in you. Somebody say, give me joy. Give me joy. Give me peace. Give me 